Well, it is certainly a joy to be back here at Southeastern Seminary and to uh, see so many friends. And, you know, for years, Dr. Keithley has been trying to get me fired. And whenever he asked me to speak on Southern Baptist and Evolution, I knew that he had finally perfected his master plan. <laughs> and, so, and so this is it. So let me go ahead and tell you up front what I'm not an expert on. I am not an expert on the history of Christianity and science. I am an expert on Southern Baptist history and the history of fundamentalism. And you can't talk about those two things without talking about evolution and how evolution fits in. And so I love the way that how the story I'm going to tell uh, will make virtually no reference to scopes, uh, but you'll see there's a lot of overlap with the talk that we just heard a minute ago, uh, including even uh, some fun comics that might make a reappearance in earlier form. Uh, so, Southern Baptist and Darwinism, the evolution of a perennial controversy. In 1859, our friend Charles Darwin published his seminal work, The Origin of Species, followed by The Descent of Man in 1871. Now, these two books, as you've heard, did not invent concepts such as evolutionary biology, natural selection, human evolution, uh, but because Darwin was writing for a wider readers, readership, biological evolution became closely identified with his views, hence the name Darwinism. Among those who responded negatively to these ideas, including Southern Baptists, naturalistic evolution was so linked to Darwin uh, that, again, it became very rare to even hear the two talked about separately. What I want to do in this presentation is offer a historical survey of how Southern Baptists have responded to Darwinism, or at least what they have called Darwinism, uh, at various points in history. Uh, I've divided the paper into several different topics that develop more or less chronologically. Uh, I argue that the consensus among Southern Baptists has always been anti-evolution, but the degree to which evolution provoked open controversy, as well as what qualifies as an acceptable alternative to Darwinism, has varied at different points over the last 150 years. Evolution's always been what we might call a smoldering issue that from time to time flares up into a brush fire, maybe occasionally a forest fire, some might even say a dumpster fire. Uh, how best to put that fire out very much remains a matter of debate uh, among committed Southern Baptists. And uh, maybe not thinking in terms of putting the fire out, but of course questions of origins and the best way to frame that uh, has been a, a special cause of interest uh, for the Bush Center uh, since almost its very beginning. Uh, so again, walking through various periods in Southern Baptist history, I want to begin uh, with a story that some of you will know uh, from Baptist history classes here at Southeastern, and that is the toy controversy. While Darwin's own religious convictions uh, remain a source of ongoing discussion and frequent controversy, just Google what did Charles Darwin believe about God, and you'll find uh, historians having their version of knife fights over this. Uh, scholars agree that the second edition of The Origin of Species left an opening for individuals to at least attempt to reconcile Darwin's theories with belief in, divine, in a divine creator. Most evangelical theologians ignored this opening and rejected Darwinism. Not all of them, but most of them, perhaps most famously, uh, the Princeton Seminary theologian Charles Darwin, uh, who was one of the first to identify evolution with atheistic assumptions. He didn't think you had to be an atheist if you were an evolutionist, but he felt like the assumptions behind evolution were atheistic. However, a number of scientists and theologians embraced what uh, came to be called theistic evolution by the 1870s, affirming some of the mechanics of evolution while rejecting its naturalistic teleology. 
Most of the theologians who were open to evolution in the USA were already affirming uh, more liberal views of doctrines such as, such as uh, the inspiration of scripture, human sinfulness, the exclusivity of Christ, and thus theistic evolution became a defining feature of what came to be called modernism or liberalism, uh, especially in North America, and that gets at uh, sort of the descending stairs that we saw even a few moments ago. Not surprisingly, many of the aforementioned evolutionary brush fires in Southern Baptist life have occurred in institutions of higher education. The earliest controversy was at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, which was formed in 1859, the same year that Darwin published The Origin of Species. Old Testament professor Crawford Toy joined the Southern Seminary faculty in 1869 after three years of graduate studies at the University of Berlin. And you'll remember from the last presentation that uh, evolution was very much uh, tied to Germany and popular imagination, uh, even though it was uh, an Englishman, Charles Darwin, who had written Origin of Species. In Germany, Toy was first introduced to the historical critical method in biblical studies, uh, which was a hermeneutic influenced by evolutionary concepts. Within a couple of years of his employment at Southern, rumors were circulating that Toy was teaching the historical critical method in the classroom and that he had embraced a form of evolution. For several years, Toy's colleagues urged him not to promote controversial views in the class. Interestingly, they didn't tell him he was wrong. They said, stop promoting this in the classroom. That happens sometimes in institutions of higher education. But... Uh, Toy refused. He honestly believed that evolution was true, that it would result in a more accurate understanding of the Old Testament, and that good interpretations lead to greater spiritual maturity. So it would be a good thing for Southern Baptists to embrace these ideas. We'll be the better for it if we do so. Eventually, in 1879, Toy offered his resignation to the Board of Trustees at Southern they accepted the offer, probably to Toy's surprise. Uh, he probably didn't think they were going to accept the offer, but they did. Uh, but it worked out fine for Toy. He joined the faculty of Harvard University. Perhaps because of the Toy controversy, acceptance of evolution and holding more liberal views of Scripture would remain closely connected in the Southern Baptist imagination. And I would argue they are still very closely connected uh, among uh, the majority of Southern Baptists. If you've gone down one of these routes, you've probably gone down the other route. And that leads us to a period of time that overlaps a lot with what Ted Peters talked about, though I'm not going to talk about the same things, uh, fundamentalism, modernism, and evolution. While evolutionary views were openly promoted among many Northern Baptist scholars in the period between Toy's resignation and World War I, there was relatively little controversy among Southern Baptists at this time, perhaps because relatively few Southern Baptist professors embraced evolution, or at least openly embraced evolution. By the 1920s, however, there was open conflict among Baptists in the South over this issue, largely because of the influence of fundamentalism in general and Southern Baptist arch-fundamentalist J. Frank Norris in particular. One historian who's written a good bit on SBC controversies in the 20s notes that the evolution debates were characterized by extremism such that it was difficult to distinguish between the anti-evolution sentiments of Southern Baptist fundamentalists and non-fundamentalists. Numerous Baptist state papers published editorials in the 1920s about the dangers of evolution. Some of the comics that we saw a few minutes ago made their ways into these Baptist papers. These pieces routinely identified Darwinism with unbelief. They claimed evolution undermined biblical inspiration and authority and warned that the social implications of Darwinism opened the door to moral disaster. That's going to come up over and over again in Southern Baptist history, that Darwinism is a slippery slope, if not to unbelief, to bad moral things. <laughs> 
Editors also suggested regularly that evolution was an unproven theory. We saw this a moment ago. And that it was incompatible with time-honored scientific principles, the whole uh, science so-called uh, phenomena. Historian Jeffrey Moran notes that this latter critique was common among anti-evolutionists who argued that authentic science must be rooted in empiricism rather than the hypothetico-deductional method of Darwin, i.e., that's just a theory. Real science deals with facts. This remains a critique of evolution among contemporary creationists, especially at the more popular level. We'll talk a lot about that at the end of the paper. In the period under consideration, while moderate creationists attempted to critique the assumptions and implications of evolution without necessarily commending a more literalistic interpretation of Genesis, most Southern Baptists in the 1920s and 1930s were literalists who were suspicious of any sort of figural interpretations of creation. Now, Frank Norris is one of the most colorful and controversial figures in Southern Baptist history. We don't even have time to begin to scratch the surface of all that is J. Frank Norris and his peculiarities. For our purposes, it's enough to note that he was a fundamentalist crusader in the South who, like his northern counterparts, William Bell Riley and John Roach Stratton, closely tied evolution to unbelief, despite the fact that there were theistic evolutionists who said, I still believe and I'm an evolutionist. They were convinced it would eventually lead to unbelief. Through much of the 1920s, Norris was on the hunt for signs of evolution in Southern Baptist institutions at the same time that states were passing the very sorts of anti-evolution laws that led to the Scopes trial in 1925, uh, which we heard about in the last session. Norris went after evolutionists, especially in his home state of Texas. He addressed the Texas state legislature calling for a law outlawing the teaching of evolution in the state's public schools. The same sort of debates that led to the law that caused the Scopes trial. Frank Norris is testifying before the state legislature in Texas on the need for the same type of law. He accused Southwestern Seminary historian W.W. W. Barnes of being an evolutionist, though that accusation gained little traction. He lost that crusade. But he was far more successful in his agitations against Baptist-related Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Joseph Dawson, who was the longtime pastor of First Baptist Church in Waco, a close supporter of Baylor, one of their trustees, he was one of the most outspoken theistic evolutionist pastors in the Southern Baptist Convention. Lots of Baylor faculty members and students were members of his church. And that might be what originally put Baylor on the radar, was one of the few pastors writing from this. He, he pastors all these members uh, who have ties to Baylor. This may have created suspicion. However, uh, the suspicion, wherever it came from, uh, Norris pressed successfully for the, remover, the removal of Baylor sociologist Grover Samuel Dow from the faculty in 1921 because Dow had affirmed theistic evolution in a sociology textbook. A few years later, in 1925, a Baylor zoologist, O.C. Bradbury, resigned uh, because of his theistic evolutionary beliefs, which were not in print, but which he had talked about in the classroom. Anti-evolutionists scored other victories against evolutionary scholars in the 1920s. In 1924, Henry Fox was forced out as a professor of biology at Mercer University in Georgia. Now, this was not that controversial because Henry Fox was an honest-to-God liberal. Uh, he had refused to affirm the deity of Christ and the virgin birth whenever they began the heresy trial over his evolution. So that was pretty cut and dry. He was a modernist who believed in evolution rather than somebody who was more theologically conservative who was entertaining evolutionary ideas. Uh, two years later, uh, biologist Andrew Lee Pickens was fired from Furman University uh, for affirming evolution in a newspaper article. Furman is near where I live in upstate South Carolina. Uh, Pickens, in turn, went to work for the state of California, where he became the leading American expert on termites. That has nothing to do with the paper, but there was no way I couldn't share that. <laughs> that uh, he, gets, he, gets, he gets fired for being an evolutionist, and then he becomes the termite guy. 
while Norris had been effectively sidelined from Southern Baptist life by the mid-1920s, other fundamentalists pushed for an anti-evolution confessional statement at the 1925 meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, this is the meeting that's going to produce the Baptist faith and message of 1925. Uh, E.Y. Mullins uh, was the president of Southern Seminary at the time, and he had positioned Southern as a moderately creationist institution that opposed evolution, but that did not explicitly affirm what people in the SBC at least were beginning to call a literal view of creation. For example, uh, Southern missiologist W.O. Carver wrote throughout the 1920s uh, a number of popular articles about the need to find a middle ground between theistic evolution and literalism, uh, and those articles drew scorn uh, from anti-evolutionists who believed that he had conceded too much ground to modernists. Again, the sort of slippery slope arguments that were alluded to a few minutes ago. Notably, Mullins also chaired the committee that drafted the Baptist Faith and Message in 1925. That confession was adopted without a reference to evolution, even though the evolution debate is what provoked the very discussion that created the Baptist Faith and Message uh, 1925. The confession comes out, it does not reference evolution. This infuriated fundamentalists in the Southern Baptist Convention, including fellow committee member C.P. Staley, who was the fundamentalist editor of the Oklahoma Baptist Messenger. He was also the father of Sidnor Staley, who was the first president of Southeastern Seminary. Staley Hall on this campus is named for uh, Sidnor Staley. We're talking about his dad, who was an editor in Oklahoma. Staley led Oklahoma Baptists to withhold giving to Southern Seminary because of concerns that Mullins was really a theistic evolutionist, even though Mullins explicitly rejected that position in print and in private correspondence. Nevertheless, uh, now that the Oklahoma Baptists were doing this, Kentucky Baptist fundamentalists were also spreading rumors that Southern Seminary was heterodox when it comes to the doctrine of creation. And all that leads to 1926 at the Southern Baptist Convention meeting when George McDaniel, who was the president of the SBC, uh, gave uh, the opening presidential address. And in that address, he affirmed what he considered to be a traditional view of creation. Uh, he, said, he didn't use the language young earth. They weren't using that language yet. Uh, but he called it a literal view of creation through God's spoken word uh, on real days and a literal Adam and Eve. And, and these were sort of the things that he talked about in his sermon Fundamentalists managed successfully to have the convention pass a resolution endorsing McDaniel's sermon statement as kind of official convention policy and calling upon all SBC institutions and boards to affirm the McDaniel statement. This was not what McDaniel was after. He was sharing his opinion, but fundamentalists jumped on this and what they got was kind of a quasi-confessional statement that everybody was supposed to affirm. Uh, Mullins obliged... At Southern, he said, I can buy into that. The faculty bought into that. And the anti-evolutionist critics uh, backed off, and, and it wasn't a big deal at Southern for a little bit longer. Now, one evolutionary controversy during this period uh, that got referenced in passing a few minutes ago that's kind of an outlier, it's different than all the others, uh, took place on this campus. William Lewis Poteet. Oops, let's go back. We'll get to him in a minute. William Lewis Poteet taught natural science for 47 years at Wake Forest College on this campus. Uh, the last 22 of those years, he was also the president of Wake Forest. Poteet was one of, uh, a member of one of the most prominent family of Baptist educators in the country. Uh, his sister Ida was an art professor at Meredith College in Raleigh, which was at that time a Baptist institution. His brother Edwin McNeil Poteet Sr. Uh, was president of Furman University in Greenville. And his nephew Edwin McNeil Poteet Jr. served as president of Colgate Rochester Divinity School in New York. Uh, they were a family of Baptist educators. The Poteet men in particular were all outspoken modernists. And they were Southern Baptist champions of the social gospel at a time when most Southern Baptists uh, had not even heard of the social gospel. They were popularizing that in the SBC. 
According to his biographer, Poteet, quote, closely followed the developments of modern biology and was exceptionally frank in teaching evolution. By 1922, Poteet's views had become widely known among Baptists in the South, and he attempted to make the case for theistic evolution in the pages of the North Carolina Baptist periodical, The Biblical Recorder. In subsequent articles, Poteet applied the Baptist principle of liberty of conscience to academic freedom, arguing that Baptist scholars should be free to reconcile scientific findings with the Christian faith. At the 1922 annual meeting of the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina, Poteet preached a widely praised sermon, he was a good preacher, that temporarily deflected criticism from his evolutionary beliefs. Poteet subsequently survived further attempts to remove him during the height of the fundamentalist modernist controversies, largely because of his oratory skills. He preached in churches all over North Carolina and they liked his preaching and because of the respect he had among the pastors in the North Carolina Convention. Poteet was also protected by his friend and fellow theistic evolutionist Richard Van, who was the founding president of Meredith College, but left there to be the secretary of the Baptist State Convention's education board. Uh, he provided cover to Poteet. Poteet retires both beloved by Baptists for his preaching and suspect because of his open evolutionary beliefs. Uh, he's kind of the exception that proves the rule during all these controversies uh, among Southern Baptists in the 20s and 30s. And that leads us to the quiet years. The period from about 1930 to 1960 could be considered the quiet years when it comes to Southern Baptists and evolution there were no significant controversies related to the topic. Having said that, let me share with you a frustrating truth about those of us who are historians. We have a number of historians in the room. They know this is true even if they don't admit it. This is a frustrating truth about historians. There are certain things that we historians are 98% sure about based upon anecdotal and circumstantial evidence, but that we cannot absolutely prove because there's not an unimpeachable paper trail. This happens to us all the time. We know that happened, but we can't absolutely prove it because there's no slam dunk documentary evidence that we can use. I would argue that that phenomenon applies to the topic at hand. I think that there are some solid, let's not call it evidence, let's call it hints that evolution was quietly on the rise in the Southern Baptist Convention during the quiet period. And I'll give you just a few examples of some of that anecdotal and circumstantial evidence. First of all, historically in Southern Baptist life, as we saw with the toy controversy, theistic evolution was rarely a belief embraced in isolation from other progressive views, especially uh, progressive accounts of biblical inspiration and authority. We know for certain that after World War II especially, large numbers of Baptist scholars and seminary educated pastors in the Southern Baptist Convention adopted the historical critical method of interpretation and raised concerns about the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture. So it seems reasonable to guess that many of them also were at least open to evolution, since in the SBC context, they often were tied together. Many of them had also begun, uh, excuse me, second, when evolution began to become a hot topic in the 1960s, we'll get to that later, a number of theologians published works that seemed to be at least sympathetic to theistic evolution. Many of them had begun teaching in the post-war era. So they're writing books in the 60s, but they're teaching in the 40s, it's reasonable to guess that they were teaching what they wrote before they wrote it. A final line of anecdotal evidence is that fundamentalist critics of the Southern Baptist Convention, like John R. Rice and all the colorful personalities uh, 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 who were associated with Bob Jones University, routinely accused Baptist-related schools of harboring evolutionists. Now, these non-Southern Baptist fundamentalists are not neutral observers. They're not neutral observers. They don't like the Southern Baptist Convention and they're trying to prove a point. Sometimes they were prone to overstatement, but I'm just going to tell you, they also had a knack uh, 
for noticing smoke in the SBC that sometimes indicated fire in the SBC. They got some things right. So it seems likely that some of the smoke they thought they saw, some of the rumors they were hearing about evolutionists and Baptist colleges and universities and seminaries was not absolute bunk, but that there was at least some of that going on. So it seems to me likely that during these quiet years, there was theistic evolution, I do think it's theistic evolution, uh, that was being taught in Baptist schools and was being believed by Baptist pastors. But these years were quiet uh, because it wasn't out in the open. People weren't writing books about this. They weren't preaching uh, widely distributed sermons about this. There was no controversy over evolution during the quiet years. Instead, we have what we might think of as uh, the DNA of a controversy. Uh, that's going to evolve uh, into something exciting with the introduction of creation science. So we've heard about some of this already with the previous presentation. While Southern Baptists and most other evangelicals were anti-evolution during the first half of the 20th century, there was no consensus about the age of the earth or which elements in Genesis might be literal and might be figurative. Some creationists, not a majority, as we've already heard, argued for a literal six-day creation and they thought the earth was less than 10,000 years old. This view would come to be called young earth creationism, and it did enjoy uh, an ancient pedigree among some Christian thinkers, but it had never really been all that popular until uh, the 1650s when an uh, Irish theologian named James Usher uh, first proposed the chronology that dated the earth to around 6,000 years old. When anti-evolutionists speak of a literal view of creation increasingly from the 1960s on, that's going to be a synonym for young earth creation. If you hear literal, what they mean is the earth isn't old. Other creationists argued for a literal six-day creation, but they posited a significant gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. This was also referenced in the last paper. Uh, so the earth was much older. There were several varieties of old earth creationism, but two were popular in the mid-20th century. Gap creationism was especially popular among dispensationalists because it was found in the study notes of the Schofield Reference Bible. Forgive me for my weak picture. I'm bringing weak game after Ted Peters actually gave you a snapshot of the footnotes. And the best I can do is this puny picture of the Bible itself. Um, so, uh, it was in the study notes of the Schofield Reference Bible. Still other creationists were non-literalists who argued that the days in Genesis represented uh, larger periods of time and that the earth was much older than 10,000 years. Uh, Day-age creationism is what we call that. It was popular, as we have already heard, with some of the leading anti-evolutionists during the fundamentalist modernist controversies like William Jennings Bryan and William Bell Riley, uh, both of whom held to day-age creationism. Young Earth, Gap, and day-age creationism were found among evangelicals, including Southern Baptists during the post-war era. In 1961, however, young earth creationism received a significant boost in popularity with the publication of the aforementioned book, The Genesis Flood, co-authored by John Whitcomb and Henry Morris. The Genesis Flood defended a young earth chrono chronology by arguing that the flood of Genesis 6 through 8 was a global event that resulted in various phenomena that give the appearance that the earth is very old even though it's not very old. Whitcomb, who Dr. Keithley mentioned passed away earlier this month, was an evangelical theologian in the Grace Brethren tradition. But Henry Morris, the other co-author, was uh, the head of the civil engineering program at Virginia Tech University and a Southern Baptist layman when the Genesis flood was published. However, 
Because of the Genesis flood, Morris actually left the SBC and became an independent fundamentalist Baptist. Uh, it's because he published the book, gave a copy to his Southern Baptist pastor in Blacksburg, Virginia, and his Southern Baptist pastor read the book and said, this is interesting, but I mean, this contradicts what all the scientists say. How could you believe this? And so Morris left, and, uh, and he became a fundamentalist. The Genesis flood was intended to be a response to Bernard Ram's 1954 book, The Christian View of Science and Scripture. Bernard Ram was a Baptist theologian on the faculty of Baylor University at the time this book was published. He did not sojourn long with Southern Baptists, only about a decade. But during that decade, this book was written. Ram was an old earth creationist who did not defend any particular theory in his book, but rather presented several interpretive options. However, what rankled literalists was that Ram dismissed the young earth view and flood geology as incompatible with the findings of modern science. So it's not so much that he affirmed theistic evolution as it was he rejected out of hand the young earth view and flood geology. And that rankled the more conservative, if you will, creationists. Ram was a member of the evangelical scholarly organization, the American Scientific Affiliation, and his views very quickly, within less than a decade, became widely influential in that group. Though Ram rejected theistic evolution, at least at this stage, there's some debate about what happens with him later, uh, at least now in the 50s and 60s, he would have rejected theistic evolution. Many creationists were convinced that Ram's views were opening the door to theistic evolution and that it was starting to gain traction among evangelical theologians and scientists because of this Pandora box that Bernard Ram has opened that says there is no place for a young earth or flood geology. And that brings us to the Genesis controversies in the Southern Baptist Convention. Excuse me, I have to cough. <coughs> Try not to cough into the mic. Within the Southern Baptist Convention itself, evolution was at least tangentially connected to two controversies over Genesis in the 1960s. In 1961, Midwestern Seminary professor Ralph Elliott published a book titled The Message of Genesis. Eliot embraced the historical critical method and he advanced a non-literal interpretation of not just Genesis 1 and 2, but the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Convention conservatives were convinced that the message of Genesis undermined biblical inspiration and authority. Eliot's book was dropped by what was then called the Baptist Sunday School Board. It's now called Lifeway Christian Resources. Uh, they dropped it when the first printing sold out, and Eliot himself was terminated from Midwestern in 1962 because he refused to promise he wouldn't seek another publisher after the Baptist Sunday School Board dropped the book. The convention responded to the Eliot controversy by adopting the 1963 Baptist Faith and Message. In 1969, the Broadman Bible Commentary published its volume on Genesis, which was written by a British Baptist scholar. Note, they did not ask a Southern Baptist to write on Genesis because they didn't want another controversy. They hoped if they asked a British Baptist, it wouldn't be controversial. They miscalculated greatly. Like the message of Genesis, the new commentary adopted a non-literal interpretation of Genesis 1 through 11. The convention voted to pull the commentary, and they ordered a revised edition by a different author. My copy says, Volume 1, Revised. That's what most of them say now. If you have a copy that says the Broadman Bible Commentary, Volume 1, and it does not say Revised... I want it, and Ken Keithley will pay top dollar for it and give it to me, because it's very hard to find. As noted previously, in Southern Baptist circles, affirmation of higher criticism of the Old Testament and evolution were closely connected in the denominational imagination. People assumed if you had one, you had the other. They went together like peanut butter and jelly. 
While neither Eliot nor the Brodman volume explicitly affirmed evolution, neither of them mention evolution. They don't say anything about the age of the earth. Southern Baptists were concerned that they were implicitly pro-evolution because of the view of Scripture that they had and because they adopted a non-literal interpretation of creation. Thus, it is not surprising that in 1969, when W.A. Criswell published his book, Why I Believe the Bible is Literally True, by the way, while he was serving as president of the Southern Baptist Convention, he denounced evolution as incompatible with Scripture. And he suggested that a high view of Scripture necessitated a literal view of interpretation. He has those other two books in mind when he makes that argument. Harold Lenzel, a former editor of Christianity Today, and at this time a Southern Baptist church member in Columbia, South Carolina, also connected a literal view of Genesis with biblical inerrancy in his controversial 1976 book, The Battle for the Bible. For both of these men, W.A. Criswell and Harold Lenzel, a literal interpretation of Scripture meant the young earth creationist position. Those two phrases are now fixed as synonyms in the minds of most people. And that leads us to the role of evolution in the culture wars and how this affects Southern Baptists. The idea that literal means young earth is exactly the argument that creation scientists were making during the 1960s and the 1970s and up to the, parent, the present day. Biblical inerrancy, <coughs> biblical inerrancy for creation scientists virtually necessitates a literal interpretation of Genesis in an age of the earth less than 10,000 years old. Henry Morris helped form the, the Creationist Research Society in 1963. In 1970, that group published a Young Earth Creationist textbook that was used primarily in private Christian schools, though there actually were a handful of public school districts that uh, adopted their Young Earth Creationist textbook. Zondervan uh, published it, and there were, uh, as best as uh, Ronald Numbers, the historian can tell, uh, about a half dozen public school districts uh, that adopted it that we know of. But it was primarily Christian schools that adopted it. More significantly, though, in 1972, Morris split from the Creationist Research Society to form the Institute for Creation Research, an apologetics ministry that has experienced considerable controversy over the years because of their ongoing attempts to offer graduate level degrees in science. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth over the years in the state of Texas, uh, giving approval, taking away approval as to whether they can be a graduate school of science. As of right now, they are not awarding graduate degrees in science. And said they're awarding degrees in the apologetics of science uh, so that they can uh, defend young earth creationism. They can't get accreditation to actually offer graduate degrees in the sciences. In 1980, uh, a group called the Creation Science Foundation was formed in Australia. When that ministry opened an American branch in 1994, it rebranded as Answers in Genesis. Answers in Genesis is arguably the most influential young earth creationist organization today. In recent years, their creation museum and the Ark Encounter have remained extremely popular among evangelicals and a source of ongoing controversy in the secular media. Uh, you might think about it this way. Uh, Sunday school classes love them, some trips to the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. And uh, secular, secular journalists love them, some investigative reporting about all the money that is misused at these two attractions. Both of those things go on. I meant... Both of those people have those opinions. I wasn't necessarily implying that money is being misused. Let me clarify <laughs> that money is being that money is being misused at either of these things. I don't know because I've not been there. Creation science organizations played a significant role in establishing young earth creationism as the dominant form of creationism, at least at the popular level. 
largely through their influence upon private Christian schools and by the 1980s, the Christian homeschool movement. Evangelical congregations, including many Southern Baptist churches, began establishing Christian private schools in large numbers in the 1960s. Most of these earliest private Christian schools in the South were what have uh, derisively but accurately been called segregation academies because they were formed in response to the forced desegregation of public schools. Uh, make no mistake about it, the private Christian school movement began in the South so that dark-skinned kids would not have to go to school with light-skinned evangelical kids. That's where the private Christian school movement came from. However, however, even unbelieving historians agree that by the 1970s, the Christian school movement had evolved and that race was far less of a driving force in the continued proliferation of such schools. Segregation was being accepted widely in the culture by the 1970s. Even those schools that started as segregationist academies were beginning to allow uh, African American children to come to those schools. They were offering scholarships uh, for students of color. So there was movement in that area and the Christian schools by the 1970s were less about race and they were much more concerned with secular biases in the public. Public schools. So it becomes about secularism in the public schools. Teacher led prayer and Bible reading by this time had been excised from public schools. Sex education courses were being offered increasingly in public schools. And many history textbooks seem to evangelicals and other conservatives to be more critical and less patriotic than once was the case. All this factored into the proliferation of Christian private schools into the 70s and the early 80s. But most significant for our purposes, by this time, uh, with the advent of uh, neo-Darwinism taking hold in the previous generation, naturalistic evolution had become almost universally accepted in public school science textbooks by the 1970s. This is anecdotal, but when I have talked to families that went into public, that went into private schooling or that went into Christian homeschooling in the late 70s and early 80s, I think this is true. I'm going to say almost without fail to qualify. I actually, I'm having trouble thinking of one that didn't, but I'm going to say just to hedge it is because historians do that. Almost without fail. Everyone who I've talked to, evolution is the number one thing they name. Why did you make that choice? I did not want my child to be taught that evolution was fact or that evolution was the only option. Most evangelical parents, however, opted to leave their children in public schools. So not surprisingly, school boards all over the country experienced debate over textbooks, including science textbooks. In fact, this was one of the early galvanizing movements that contributed to the rise of the religious right in the mid-1970s. In the 1970s, Mel and Norma Gabler emerged as the public face of the fight for conservative textbooks. The Gablers were Southern Baptist laypeople in Texas. And they wanted all public school books in Texas to reflect ostensibly conservative and religious values because they said that's what Texans believe. Texans are patriotic. Our textbook, our history textbook should be patriotic. Texans don't want uh, their children having sex before marriage. They shouldn't have sex education in public schools. Texans are creationists. Science textbooks should either not teach evolution as all, as all, or they should give equal time to both evolution and creation science. For many conservative evangelicals, evolution was increasingly believed to be foundational to the secular humanist worldview. So defending young earth creationism was equivalent to defending the biblical worldview. They were tied closely together. Here is the earlier version of the comic that you saw earlier uh, from Ken Ham's book in the 1980s. I was first exposed to this whenever my uh, 
late in-laws who homeschooled back in the 80s whenever they thought that the police were going to kick down the door and take them off to prison for truancy. Uh, my wife joked she was homeschooled before it was cool. Uh, they had this poster up in their house. And I can remember dating my wife and a version much bigger than even what you see here was on the back of a door. And, uh, and this was their number one argument for why they chose to homeschool back when that was really weird. Uh, and note what's happening here. Uh, the secular humanists are attacking the foundation, the doctrine of creation, young earth creation in particular, while the Christians are attacking all these little balloons up here, abortion, uh, divorce, homosexuality, things like that. I mean, what, the idea here is that the evolutionists are going after the foundation, while the Christians are going after the fruit of evolution. Does that make sense? This is a powerful image. And it captured the imagination of many anti-evolutionists, especially those who were part of uh, the Christian homeschool movement and the Christian private school movement in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s and into the 1990s. Now, Southern Baptist politicians could be found on both sides of the textbook wars. President Jimmy Carter, a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher at the time, created the Department of Education in 1980, which textbook activists uh, reviewed with considerable suspicion. It was big government that was going to mandate textbooks for school districts. That's what they were scared of. So Jimmy Carter, Southern Baptist, he's the bad guy in this, in the minds of anti-evolutionists. Jesse Helms, another Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher from Raleigh, North Carolina, unsuccessfully agitated for the Republican Party to add opposition to federal funding for controversial textbooks to the party's platform in 1976. He wanted the GOP to go on the record that they were against textbooks that were unpatriotic and taught evolution as fact rather than theory. And that leads us to the late unpleasantries, the conservative resurgence in the Southern Baptist Convention. As the conservative resurgence began in the Southern Baptist Convention in 1979, the Republican Party was undergoing its own conservative resurgence, in part through the influence of the religious right. Now, I'm going to venture what some may consider to be a controversial statement. I have long argued it is impossible to understand the history of the SBC between 1979 and 2000 without understanding the history of the religious right during that same era. Southern Baptists have almost always been closely connected to political conservatism. And the fortunes of the convention and the fortunes of political conservatism have often been closely intertwined. Think of the internal debates among Southern Baptists since the 2016 election, or since Tuesday, <laughs> and I would say they've only confirmed this assessment. That is another topic for another day if Dr. Keithley really wants to get me fired. For our purposes, it's enough to note that a publicly engaged form of anti-Darwinism became closely tied to the religious right, which means almost by definition, it also became identified with movement conservatism in the Southern Baptist Convention. Leaders in the religious right, including some who were or who became Southern Baptists, often tied acceptance of naturalistic evolution with the inevitability of moral declension. There's that argument again. If it doesn't lead to unbelief, it will at least lead to very bad things. Jerry Falwell was the most public leader in the religious right. He was a confidant of many leading Southern Baptist pastors, and he became a Southern Baptist himself in the mid-1990s. Falwell made the evolution leads to moral anarchy argument over and over again in the 1980s and 1990s in his sermons and in his published writings. A less well-known example is Ed McAteer, who founded the Religious Roundtable, one of the organizations that was part of the religious right in the 1980s and 1990s. Ed McAteer was an active member of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, where Adrian Rogers was pastor. 
McAteer admitted that he and many of his fellow compatriots in the religious right actually wanted to outlaw evolution completely, but since that was not feasible at that moment in American history, their strategy instead was to argue that evolution and creationism should be taught side by side in the classroom. They wanted to outlaw evolution, but that wouldn't work, so let's get creation science taught side by side, and then this will slowly win the day, and one day we will be able to outlaw evolution. Another example is James Robison. You've probably not heard of James Robison, or if you have, you don't identify him with the SBC because he's not Southern Baptist anymore. He left in the 1990s and became a charismatic. But James Robison was a Southern Baptist megachurch pastor in the early 1980s, and he hosted the National Affairs Briefing in 1980 where Ronald Reagan famously said, you can endorse me, evangelicals, but I endorse you. He tied the religious right to Ronald Reagan's presidency. He was also an outspoken anti-evolutionist. Not surprisingly, since the religious right was concerned about the influence of evolution, the increasingly conservative Southern Baptist Convention was as well. In 1980, the SBC passed a resolution that affirmed a literal understanding of creation, quote, as recorded in the Bible. It doesn't mention the age of the earth. doesn't talk about a literal six days, but I would argue it's definitely implied in the language. Two years later, in 1982, the convention went further with a resolution affirming scientific creationism as a viable alternative to evolution that should be taught alongside evolution as an alternate theory in public school classrooms. In 1984, a resolution against secular humanism explicitly tied secularism to widespread acceptance of creation as a myth and evolution as a scientific fact. Again, Implicit in these statements to varying degrees is the belief that creationism means young earth creationism, a young earth. A commitment to a literal view of creation was part of the conservative litmus test during the 1980s and 1990s. Nancy Ammerman discusses this topic in her seminal study, Baptist Battles. If you only read one book about the inerrancy controversy in the Southern Baptist Convention, this needs to be the book. This is a sociological study that looks at the differences, theological and cultural, uh, between moderates and conservatives. In this book, she notes that Adrian Rogers and W.A. Criswell were on the record affirming a literal view of creation. She also recounts a conversation with a conservative messenger who planned to support Adrian Rogers at the 1986 SBC meeting. When she pressed him for why he was voting for Dr. Rogers, Rogers, his rationale was that he had read an article claiming that evolution was being taught in Baptist schools. Adrian Rogers wouldn't stand for that. In his recent study of creationism, Christopher Turney also provides documentary evidence that Southern Baptist Convention presidents Bailey Smith, Jimmy Draper, and Charles Stanley all denounced evolution and affirmed a literal creation, tying belief in a literal creation to affirmation of biblical inerrancy. Jerry Vines, another Southern Baptist Convention president, even published a book-length defense of young earth creationism cleverly titled 24-7. As with the religious right in general, these Baptist leaders equated affir affirmation of Darwinism with the slide toward moral declension in the culture. By the early 21st century, some Southern Baptist scholars were also promoting young earth creationism as the biblical position, and this was especially the case at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Albert Moeller began writing and speaking periodically in defense of young earth uh, creationism in the mid-2000s. His popularity as an internet essayist and public speaker have positioned him in recent years as one of uh, the leading theological allies of scientific creationists. If, if you Google Al Mohler and creationism, uh, you'll find a number of conferences and debates that he's participated in. Uh, I don't think he was a young earth creationist before the early 2000s, uh, but he has been since about 2005, at least in his public posture, and now is identified as one of the leaders uh, of that position. 
Russell Moore, who served as Southern Seminary's chief academic officer from 2004 to 2013 before he served as the leading rabble rouser in the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, also came out in favor of young earth creationism in the mid-2000s. Moore actually talks about how this was an intellectual conversion for him from old earth creationism. Uh, he was deeply influenced by the writings of Carl F.H. Henry and Bernard Ram, both of whom were old earth creationists, and so that's what he held to until the early 2000s whenever he embraces young earth creationism. If you Google Russell Moore and creationism, you can find the article where he explains his journey on this issue. Kurt Wise, a Southern Baptist paleontologist, by the way, as an aside, can I just say, I love saying the phrase Southern Baptist paleontologist. Right now, I have a six-year-old who would love to be a Southern Baptist paleontologist whenever he grows up. So I, I was writing it, it brought a smile to my face. Maybe one day, Fuller Finn, maybe one day. Uh, Kurt Wise, a Southern Baptist paleontologist, also emerged during this period as one of the leading defenders of young earth creationism. From 2006 to 2009, Wise directed Southern Seminary Center for Theology and Science before later becoming director of Truett McConnell College's Creation Research Center. Uh, my friend Greg Allison, uh, who has taught at Southern Seminary since 2003, has written for the Young Earth Creationist Ministry Answers in Genesis and has contributed to a recent collection of essays critiquing theistic evolution. Uh, so just using Southern as an example, you can find examples at Southeastern and Southwestern and Midwestern and all of our Southern Baptist seminaries and our colleges and universities as well. Uh, it's not just that pastors uh, gravitate to Young Earth Creationism, also many Southern Baptist scholars do. But not everybody, which leads us to intelligent design. The 1990s witnessed a new entry in the anti-Darwinist movement with the rise of intelligent design. Intelligent design has ancient roots, but in its modern form, it's a collection of philosophical and scientific critiques of naturalistic evolution that rely upon evidence and natural revelation rather than special revelation. As such, you might think about it this way. Intelligent design is compatible with theism, and that includes Christian theism, but it, is not technically it does not technically necessitate theism. There might be other ways to explain intelligent design. For that reason, young earth creationists who are driven primarily by their interpretation of Genesis 1-2 are often critical of intelligent design. Uh, they say it's insufficiently Judeo-Christian. While intelligent design was discussed among scientists in the 1980s, it was the lawyer Philip Johnson's 1991 book, Darwin on Trial, that brought the con conversation into evangelical circles. Other seminal works in the movement followed, notable, uh, notably uh, the biochemist Michael uh, Behe's Darwin's Black Box in 1996 and the mathematician William Dembski's The Design Inference in 1998. Dembski later taught at both Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, though his rejection of young earth creationism was controversial and, uh, well, there's just rumors. So he taught at those schools. He doesn't teach at either of them anymore. He's not a young earth creationist. Uh, but I don't have a paper trail, so I'm just passing on rumors because that's what historians do. Uh, the Discovery Institute, founded in 1990, uh, became the most prominent think tank committed to the promotion of intelligent design. Uh, it was certainly, intelligent design was not accepted by all conservative Christians, but even many of the young earth creationists who did not think intelligent design went far enough certainly appreciated the apologetic value of those ID critiques of Darwinism. By the late 1990s, school boards that had once debated whether or not scientific creationism should be taught alongside evolution were now debating whether or not intelligent design should be taught in public school classrooms. For their part, evolutionists persistently argued that intelligent design was really a Trojan horse for creationism. And to be fair, sometimes intelligent design proponents lent credibility to that concern, as was the case with the so-called wedge document that the Discovery Institute published internally in 1998. As an aside, if you write something that you don't want circulated, you made a mistake in writing it. 
eventually it will get circulated. Someone will read your mail. And that's what happened with the intelligent design movement. Uh, Their secret manifesto, which is not a secret anymore, discussed how intelligent design could be used as a strategy to advance the Christian worldview in the public square. When the document was leaked, evolutionists said, see, see, because that was what at least some intelligent design advocates were doing. It was a Trojan horse. There's actually a book titled The Trojan Horse, which is about this very topic. One of the individuals most responsible for popularizing intelligent design was Charles Colson, a former Nixon administration aide who became a Christian in the wake of the Watergate scandal. Many of you are familiar with Mr. Colson and Prison Fellowship. Uh, but by the 1990s, he had emerged as one of the leading proponents of the Christian worldview. Colson was also a Southern Baptist layman. Colson and his frequent co-author Nancy Piercy, a fellow at the Discovery Institute, promoted the work of intelligent design in their books, Colson and Piercy's books, on the Christian worldview. As a personal aside, I heard of intelligent design in the 1990s uh, whenever I was a college student, uh, but it was in reading Colson and Piercy's 1998 book, How Now Shall We Live, uh, that I first seriously was introduced to intelligent design, and that led me to read some of those books that we were just talking about that were the early books in the intelligent design movement. That was Chuck Colson's writings that were the gateway drug for me uh, into becoming familiar with intelligent design, and I think that's the case with many people. Getting near the end, old earth creationism. Not all Southern Baptist critics of Darwinism affirmed young earth or identified with the ID movement. The apologists John Ankerberg and John Weldon published a number of books that critiqued Darwinian evolution and affirmed old earth creationism. Like their sometime collaborator, astrophysicist Hugh Ross, Ankerberg and Weldon affirmed a version of the day-age theory that they called progressive creationism. Ankerberg is a member of my best friend's Southern Baptist Church in Chattanooga, and Weldon earned his Doctor of Ministry from Luther Rice Seminary, a school that is in the Southern Baptist tradition, uh, though they do not support cooper- they don't do not receive cooperative program dollars. Philosopher William Lane Craig has written in defense of the Kalam cosmological argument, which we're not going to go into detail with right now, but it's a revival of a, of a medieval philosophical defense uh, that actually uh, began among uh, Islamic philosophers, but was also compatible with some of the views that you found among medieval Christian theologians. Uh, Craig is a member of a Southern Baptist church in metropolitan Atlanta. Two Southern Baptist scholars, uh, theologian Hal Poe and chemist Jimmy Davis, uh, they're former colleagues of mine from Union University, Uh, they have collaborated on three books related to science and faith. Uh, They write from an old earth creationist perspective, although they write about a variety of different topics. Uh, That's where they're coming from. More recently, several Southern Baptist scholars in this room who are at least sympathetic to old earth creationism, participated in a series of discussions with scholars from Hugh Ross's organization's Reason to Believe and the BioLogos Foundation, which promotes theistic evolution. Uh, This is the book uh, that came out of that, and as you have seen, it is for sale uh, over in uh, the building next door, and all proceeds go to Ken Keithley's slush fund. Uh, the Southern, a number of Southern Baptist old earth creationists or potential older, I don't know that all of them have owned it, so I won't name names. I'll just say there's a bunch of old earth creationists or people who hang out, out with old earth creationists who are in this room or who are the presidents of seminaries and towns that celebrate Mardi Gras that uh, contributed to this book. Uh, landing the Plane. In this paper, I have sought to offer something like a grand narrative of Southern Baptist responses to Darwinism. Historically, Southern Baptists have run the gamut from theistic evolutionists to young earth creationists. Most folks decidedly tilted towards the latter, I think. At times, Southern Baptists have experienced significant controversy over evolution, though most of the time this issue has been more of a friendly discussion among committed anti-Darwinists about the finer points of creationism. At present, the Southern Baptist Theological Academy includes both young earth and old earth creationists, likely with a few theistic evolutionists also who keep their heads down low and smile a lot. Uh, 
it is somewhat harder to gauge the diversity of views among scientists who teach at Baptist-related schools. But there are some schools that require their faculties to adhere to the Young Earth view. A couple of examples would be true at McConnell and Bruton Parker in Georgia. There are some that allow for both young earth and various type of old earth creationists. My institution, North Greenville University, would be in that middle category. And there are some Baptist schools that are comfortable employing anti-evolutionary creationists as well as theistic evolutionists. My former institution, Union University and Baylor University, uh, would be examples of those. We need to be willing to admit that all of these positions cannot be right, and indeed it is possible that all of them are wrong. Furthermore, every institution should be free to establish their own boundaries when it comes to these matters and accountable to whoever, whichever sponsoring Baptist body they're related to. But in closing, let me say I am hopeful that Southern Baptist life in general will be evidenced by a hospitable orthodoxy on this issue that allows a place at the table for any scholar who claims Jesus as Lord adheres to a high view of Scripture and affirms belief in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Naturally, I select you, Charles Darwin says. Thank you very much.